Welcome to The Connecting Point. Wow. <laughs> wow, what a song. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for your appreciation. Um, but I'm like Joe. There's a lot of people that I know you uh, appreciate us, but there's a lot of people that, um, that, do, that allow us to be and do what we do. And, um, of course, you never want to uh, start with names, but all of those folks that work in the office, and uh, Carol and Mary and Judy and um, Darlene and um, Kathy, all of these, it, the people working behind the scenes here, sharing um, that you have no idea um, that work in this church. And, and I thank you for that. And I thank you folks for that, um, allowing us to do that. We're in a message series entitled Heaven, an Insider's Guide. And uh, thank you for all of your comments, well, especially the good ones, um, about the messages. Um, many of you uh, expressed uh, wanting uh, some of these series of messages. Um, we do have them on uh, CD. Uh, well, you can get those if you'll just let us know. Uh, we can get the guys, Scooter and Kurt, those guys can make, uh, make some CDs. Daniel, they can make those. And um, um, if you would like a copy of these. But we're looking at uh, a series on heaven. I, thought, I felt like it was very fitting to uh, have a guide on our uh, uh, message series on heaven considering we've been going through Omega Trail the last couple of weeks. And uh, wow, what a, what a blessed experience that has been. And uh, I hope that you'll be here tonight uh, as we close it down. It's going to be kind of sad. Uh, mixed emotions, some of you. Uh, mixed emotions, right? Some of you are going to be sad to see it go. Others of you are going to wave bye-bye um, as you, get, you finally get some rest, right? But it has been a, just a great, great opportunity. I've really enjoyed Omega Trail because it's gave, given me an opportunity uh, to fellowship with a lot of you that I've not been able to do that uh, other than on Sunday morning, um, that kind of thing. But I've been able to really fellowship with a lot of you, get to know a lot of you, uh, get to know a lot of you better, uh, better than I really wanted to know you. <laughs> You've got to know me. Uh, but here's what we're going to do this morning. Uh, we are going to look at our first series. Our first message in the series was literally entitled Getting Ready for the Trip. Going on the trip of a lifetime. Now, if you're getting ready to go on a trip, there's some things that you want to do. You want to pack some things. You want to know some things. We talked about um, getting to know the author of heaven, the creator, the builder of heaven, which was God. And we talked about the way to heaven, which was Jesus. We talked about the cost of heaven, which was paid. We talked about the currency of heaven, which is faith. Well, then last week we uh, looked at um, what happens when a person dies. And many of you have had questions. And it's been really neat because the messages have kind of built upon the questions that you had from the first message. Uh, many of you have asked questions uh, concerning heaven, some that I can answer. And there are some that I just cannot answer. And I'm okay with saying I can't answer and I don't know the answer to them. Uh, but there's some questions that people have asked. Like, for instance, this message today, we're going to literally look at the activity guide in heaven. What will we be doing in heaven? Many of you have asked that question. What are we going to be doing in heaven? And so for that answer, what I want you to do is turn in your Bible to the last book of the Bible, and that is the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, we're going to be all over the book of Revelation this morning. I want to share with you a couple of things out of, that guy, uh, out of Revelation. Chapter 21. So if you'll turn to Revelation chapter 21, we're going to look at verses 1 through 5. That's going to be our launching pad this morning. We are going to literally launch off from these verses of Scripture. And uh, um, so there is a couple of books that I wanted to share with you um, that I have felt very, they have been very helpful in me in, uh, in studying for these messages. Uh, Randy Alcorn wrote a book just simply entitled Heaven. That is one of the best books, um, other than, of course, the Bible, um, on heaven that I, I have found. It is just a really good book. And there's another one, too, a um, man by the name of, um, well, his name escaped me right now, Dan Schaefer. He wrote a book called uh, A Better Country, Preparing for Heaven. And so those two books are very helpful, and I'm actually going to be quoting some from them uh, this morning. Uh, but as we began to look at heaven, we began to look at what are we going to do in heaven? What, what is there to do? You know, what, what, what will we be doing in heaven? A lot of people say that heaven's just going to be boring. That's what I've heard people say that. As a matter of fact, in 1977, um, a man by the name of Billy Joel. Anybody remember Billy Joel? Play us a song, Piano Man. All right. 
Billy Joel wrote a song entitled, Only the Good Die Young. And in that song, now raise your hand if you've ever heard that. All you old people, good. <laughs> Me too. I love Billy Joel. But he wrote a song, and here's what it says in that. Listen to what it says. They say there's a heaven for those who wait. Some say it's better, but I say it ain't. I'd rather laugh with the sinners than cry with the saints. The sinners are much more fun. Only the good die young. That's, just, that's, what, he, that's what Billy Joel thought. That, that thinks heaven is. Now, I wanted to tell, tell him that he's in his late 60s now. He ain't so young anymore. And you know what? He did get one thing right. All of us going to die. Young, old alike. People have a, a, a different concept of what heaven is going to be like. As a matter of fact, Mark Twain wrote, um, in The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, Mark Twain writes this, and, and this is the conversation he observed. Uh, Mark Twain uh, makes this observation about heaven. She, Miss Watson, told me all about that good place. She said all a body would have to ever do up there is to go around all day long with a harp and sing forever and ever. And I asked her if she reckoned Tom Sawyer would be there, and she said not by considerable sight. I was glad about that because I wanted to be where he was and him to, me and him together. Yeah, there's a lot of people that have ideas about what heaven is all about. And one of, the, one of the saddest, I think, that I read, and I have to include it here, the mouth of the South, a man by the name of Ted Turner. You ready for this? Here's what Ted Turner had to say. In a national press club, he was speaking to the national press club, and this is what his remarks said. Remember, heaven is going to be perfect. And I really don't want to be there. Those of us that go to hell, which will be most of us in this room, most journalists are certainly not going to heaven. Who wants to go to a place that's perfect? Boring, boring, boring. Now this is some of our, what we would call, mainstream people. This is what people think about heaven so my question is is heaven going to be born i mean are we just going to go bouncing around from cloud to cloud to cloud and uh i, I mean i've hear i hear warped people sense of, of of ideas about what heaven is going to be like listen when you die you do not get wings and a halo and a harp okay when you die i heard people say well my grandma is looking down upon me hey i am going to tell you something that's the last thing she wants to do is look down on us, all right? She's not going to be there looking down on us. Your loved ones are not in heaven looking down on us. Your loved ones are not a guardian angel, okay? The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, okay? It doesn't say that we're bouncing around from cloud to cloud looking down. It doesn't say that we're, you know, we're smiling in heaven looking down as, they, as we see all of us do the right things. And, you know, I've heard somebody say that, that as they were driving along that, that they were in an automobile accident, but their, their brother that had died previously was their guardian angel, and he protected them. That, folks, I'm just going to tell you, and as I tell you a long time, and I tell you a lot of times here, there's a Greek word for that, baloney. Okay, baloney. All right? You're not a guardian angel. You're not going to become an angel. You are not going to bounce around from cloud to cloud. And, and here's, the, here's the thing I ask. The question I want to know is this. Is that what heaven is all about? And I'm going to tell you, no way, it's not. Let's look at Revelation chapter 21. Look at verses 1 through 5. Now, I want you to hear this because I want to clar clarify some things. Some, some of you have asked questions about being absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. What does that mean? Where are we when we die? What happens when a person dies? We talked about that last week. We talked about um, Abraham, uh, the rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus being in Abraham's bosom. What does that mean? It means paradise. You know, the, where, where our loved ones are right now is not the final heaven. Because look at what happens in Revelation 21. It says, and I saw a new heaven and a what? New earth. Okay, if, we are in the, if, if, if our loved ones are in the final heaven right now, then what is this all about? The new heaven and the new earth. You see, when Jesus comes back, when Jesus comes back and our resurrected bodies meets our souls, which are already with the Lord, what will happen is that's when the final heaven will be set up. 
Now, we are not in a heaven right now. Now, what does, that make, does that make sense? And some people say, well, are we in a holding place? No. No, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Well, what does that mean, Jason? I don't know, but I do know this. When I leave, when my spirit and my soul leaves this body, I'm going to be present with Jesus, and I don't care where it is. You see what I'm saying? I don't care where it is. The Bible says that when, with, when this, you walk, there is going to be a separation. Now, there is, I hope, and I'm looking at people here that will only have one separation. That's when your soul separates from your body. Now, I hope there's not a second separation where your soul separates from your body and your soul is separated from God. Now, that is what the Bible calls a second death, all right? You got a first death. All of us are going to go through the first death, right? All of us are going to go through the first death. I told you, there is one statistic that will always be correct. One out of one dies. All right, you're not gonna get you're not gonna escape this life without going through death. All right, you're not gonna you're not gonna get out of this life alive. All right, we're going to die. And here's the question though: is where do you spend eternity? Now listen to what Revelation chapter 21 says. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. You see, there's nothing else that's going to separate. That sea is gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he shall dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he shall wipe away every tear from their eyes, and they shall no longer be any more death. And there shall no longer be any more mourning or crying or pain for the first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne, behold, I am making all things new. And he said, write these words down that are faithful and true. Here's what I got to say. Ted Turner, you're going to miss that one, buddy. Because I can't wait. Do you see what heaven is going to Is heaven going to be boring? Absolutely not. There's no way that heaven's going to be boring. When Jesus comes and <clears throat> to earth again and he resurrects these old bodies and our souls, are with, he's bringing our souls with him and our bodies are going to come up out of that grave, people say, well, what's, your, what's our new bodies going to look like? I don't know. I don't know. But I know this. We ain't going to have to worry about cholesterol anymore. <laughs> you ain't going to have to worry about those love handles. You're not going to have... Those of you that have canes, you ain't going to need them anymore. Those of you that have wheelchairs, put it aside. Let me tell you, I don't know what these bodies are going to look like, but the Bible says that they're going to be perfect like Jesus. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? So is heaven going to be born? Well, let me, tell you what, let me tell you what Randy Alcorn said. He described heaven this way or this new creation this way. Here's what he says. It is no coincidence that the first two chapters of the Bible is, cre- is, is uh, uh, the first two chapters of the Bible begin with creation of the heavens and the earth, and the last two chapters begin with a recreation of the heavens and earth. All that was lost at the beginning will be restored at the end. Isn't that neat? Every inch of everything that you see. Folks, let me tell you this. Every time you look out, when you look at the vast, exp- when you look up in the sky, and you see all of those stars, every inch of everything we see has been tainted by sin. Everything, everything. When I, I told you this, when, when, when Adam and Eve sinned, here's what happened. When they ate that fruit, they destroyed three relationships. They destroyed their relationship with God. Their relationship with God was severed. Number two, their relationship with each other was destroyed. And number three, their relationship with nature was destroyed. Now, when Jesus died, he tells the thief on the cross, Behold, today you will be with me in paradise. Same word that is mentioned as Garden of Eden, which means this, Jesus Christ, by dying on the cross, repaired everything that Satan destroyed. You see what I'm saying? He repaired everything. So this new Jerusalem, this new heaven and a new earth, why does there have to be a new heaven and a new earth? Because the old one was tainted by sin. 
And Jesus Christ is going to recreate all of this. So I think that when we see a, a heaven, I just see amazement. I just see, uh, and from the scriptures, I just see something that there's absolutely no way that heaven can be boring. And I want to give you this morning, I want to give you five reasons that I believe heaven is not going to be boring right from the scriptures. All right, y'all ready? Jump in and hang on. Here we go. Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 and 2. Let me give you the first one. I don't believe that hev heaven cannot be boring because we will be exploring its infinite beauty. All right? We will be exploring his infinite beauty or its infinite beauty. Look at Revelation chapter 22, and I want you to see verses 1 and 2. And he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were the healing of the nations. That is, to me, can you just see it? How many of you love to be around water, whether it's the river, whether it's the ocean, whatever, a, 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 bub, a babbling brook. How many of you just like to be, it's, there's something about water. There's something about waterfalls. Wouldn't you agree? There's just something mesmerizing by that. You can sit and watch these things, and you can, you know, when we go camping, there's a lot of campsites or right by rivers, and you can see rivers flowing and all of that kind of, I have, let me ask you this. Think of the most beautiful place you've ever visited on the face of this planet. I've been to some beautiful places, all right? I've been to Glacier National Park in Montana. I don't know if you've ever been there, but man, wow, that is just gorgeous. I have been to the Smoky Mountain National uh, Park in, in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. I, I love going there. I've been to Yellowstone. I've been to the Atchafalaya Swamp in, Kentucky, in, in Louisiana. And I know, you know many of you go, how can a swamp be? Man, I am telling you, when you ride through there, there is just something amazing about God's creation. As you sit and as you look at all of that and you think of all of this beautiful things that you have ever seen, I am telling you, nothing compares to the heavenly city. What John is saying right here and the vision and the, the actual place that John is looking at, John is seeing this city and he is seeing the most beautiful thing that he's ever seen on the face of his, in, on the face of the earth he's never seen anything like this and the reason i say that we'll be exploring this is because we were created to explore weren't we we were i mean you're you're we are in a country today that was founded by exploration in the 1960s in the 1960s nasa it was called the what the great space race was it not John F. Kennedy said, you know, we will, we're going to put a man on the moon. We're going to go explore in space. And so we built spacecrafts to not only get us into outer space, but then a few short years after we got into outer space, then we set a man on the moon. And, and all of these kind of things. And how many of you remember uh, 2001, a space odyssey? Anybody remember that? The prediction was that we were going to be, um, we, that we were going to have these deep space capsules and it will be nothing for us just to get on Earth and go from here to Mars and all that. They missed that, didn't they? As a matter of fact, it, it, it saddens me the fact that we're not even sending up a space shuttle anymore. That bothers me. I like to explore. I like to explore. You like to explore. We were created to explore this planet. So if we were created to explore this planet, guess what we're going to do in heaven? Hey, folks, listen, we might not be able to go to Mars right now, but when we get to heaven, it won't, we won't have to have a spaceship. We will be able to explore. We will be able to see the beauty of God's vast creation that he's made. Uh, how many of you remember Star Trek? Raise your hand. How about this right here? See if these words ring a bell to you. Space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. It's continuing mission to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, to boldly go where no one has gone before. Folks, that's what we're going to do in heaven. 
We are going to be able to explore. Dan Schaefer writes this in his book. He says, God has made us to explore and discover with great delight. We use spaceships and submarines because we need them. Because our bodies are not perfectly fitted to explore our world without them. But Jesus, in his glorified body, which is the prototype of ours, was able to ignore the physical obstructions of this planet, like walls, gravity, density, and other things. Through physical himself, he vanished and reappeared. He passed through solid walls. He floated up into heaven, defying gravity. Our new bodies will be made perfectly to explore the new heaven and the new earth. We have heard the phrase in history, the golden, of, golden age of exploration. In reality, the age lies ahead of us, not behind us. Isn't that neat? When we are, we're going to have bodies like the Lord Jesus Christ. And if Jesus could defy the walls, remember when the, remember when the disciples were in the upper room and they were sitting there and they were having this prayer session and all of a sudden Jesus appears before them? How about this? Many of you, we, we, we read the Bible and we don't even really think about it. But how about this? Remember what Thomas said? The, the disciples came up to him and said, Hey, Jesus is risen. Thomas said, I don't believe that's true. He says, yeah, he's risen. And Thomas said, I, I doubt it. Thomas said, I won't believe it until I, what, feel the nail prints in his hand, and I thrust my hand into his side. Now, let's fast forward a little bit. There they are in the upper room, and Thomas is with them, and all of a sudden, Jesus appears. The door was locked, the Bible says, and Jesus appears, all right? He goes through the wall. There he is. He appears. And all of a sudden, they're all looking at him. Hey, there he is right there. And then Thomas looks up, and Jesus said, Hey, Thomas, come here a minute. Me? Yeah. You, come here. Thomas stands up, and he goes, Oh, yeah, by the way, here, Phil, right here. Yeah, go ahead. Thomas said, I ain't got to do that, I believe. You know why? You know why he said that? No, because, yeah, Jesus was standing in front of him. But I want, you to, I want to remind you, where was Jesus when Thomas asked that question? Wasn't even in the room. Jesus knew what Thomas had to say, and when he I told him, he said, go ahead and fill it. And Thomas said, no, that's all right. I believe you. I believe you. You see, w w our bodies are going to be like Jesus' body. And if Jesus can walk through walls, guess what? We're going to be able to do that too in heaven. Hey, we are not going to be limited by our physical bodies. We are going to have a new body. We are going to have a new heaven and a new earth to explore. Isn't that great? So we're going to, heaven can't be born with all the exploring we got to do. Now, let me give you the second. Let me give you another one. Let me give you another one. Heaven can't be boring because we'll be enriched by meeting new friends. Now, you'll say, well, what are you talking about, Brother Jason? Go to, go to Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9. It's a great verse of Scripture right here. Now, some of you may be saying, well, Brother Jason, you're, you're picking and choosing, like, taking verses out of the... You know, you ever tried to study Revelation? I had a new... I had a new person, a new Christian come to me one day. Just got saved. Comes to me and about a month later, just discouraged. I said, what's wrong? He said, I can't, I don't get all this stuff. I said, what do you mean? He said, I just got saved and I'm wanting to really read the scriptures. I said, well, where did you go? He said, the book of Revelation. Can I warn you? Be careful, all right? The book of Revelation is, is very symbolic, okay? Very symbolic. And so you need to have a grasp of some other things. You know, there are people that will sit and argue this and that of the book of Revelation. I hear people that say, well, you know what? They, you know, people can sit and argue about what the left toe, the third foot on the left toe of the beast in Revelation is mean, but yet miss the idea of love your neighbor as yourself. You know, I think the devil is really getting a lot of us because we're sitting and arguing a bunch of theological terms and a bunch of things that matter nothing. And all the while, people are dying and going to hell, and we're arguing about what these things represent. Look at Revelation chapter 7. Look at verse 9. In these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could count. From every nation, all tribes, all people, all tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches, were in their hands, and they cried out with a loud voice. Now, here is what I notice in that verse of Scripture that comes out in my mind, and I want you to put this down somewhere. Don't, don't get mixed up with the palm branches and all of that. Here's what I want you to see. Multitude. You ever met anybody famous? You ever met anybody famous? 
I, I love meeting people. I, I love meeting people. And, and, and it amazes me that when I meet somebody that's famous and I actually get your picture taken with them or whatever, you're, you're just at a loss for words. You know what? Many of us are going to be walking around heaven like this. Hey, you know what? You know what? I can't wait. Y'all, I can't wait to get to heaven and I can't wait to spend a couple million years with David and just say, David, how big was Goliath? Really, David, tell me about it. Oh, man, you ain't going to believe this. When I was, Can you imagine? God, I can't wait to talk to Paul. I can't wait to talk to, to Peter. And I want to ask Peter, no, Peter, tell me what it was really like when you just took a step out of that boat. Come on, tell me. Tell me what it was like to be the only human being other than Jesus Christ to walk on water. Although you did it for a little while. Tell me about it. Tell me about it. I can't wait to walk up to... Eve and to Sarah and go, man, you blew it. <laughs> I mean, I can't wait to see all of these people. I can't wait to walk and talk to Daniel. And go, Daniel, tell me, brother, how was it in the lines then? Just sit down and tell me. And old Daniel talked to me about the lines then. You see what I'm talking about? There's going to be multitudes of people that you and I have never met and we will be able to sit around for all of eternity with them. It will be like the greatest family reunion you've ever seen in your life. It's going to be one that you'll actually want to attend. It is going to be wonderful. We're going to see people. We're going to be around people. And somebody says, well, Brother Jason, what about your great-great-granddaddy that you've never seen? If my great-great-granddaddy knew Jesus Christ, guess what? I'll be able to meet him. I'll be able to see him. Guess what? Do you know what? Those of you that have had loved ones that have passed on, do you know what? If they know Jesus Christ, guess what, folks? You'll see them again. You will know them. You will be able to talk with them. People have had children that died. People say, well, what about that? Let me tell you this. Remember when Jesus said, told the disciples, you move out of the way and you let them little kids come to me. Let me tell you, he's still doing that today. This is what the, uh, 2 Samuel says. David had an infant child to die. David mourned. David fasted. He prayed. The Bible says he tore his clothes and he, 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 put it, he poured ashes over himself. And this is what David said in 2 Samuel. Here's what he said. David said, alas, my son has died. And then he says, I can't bring him back. But I can go to him. Ha! And in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, the Bible says that David went to heaven. We know that. So if David went to heaven, his son is in heaven, guess what? David and his son are back united together. What I'm telling you is this, folks. I'm telling you that there is going to be people that we are going to see and we are going to enjoy those people all of our lives. And people say, well, what is it going to be like there? We have a sin-infected heart. I love my wife. But there are things about my wife that I probably don't even know. And there are things about me that she doesn't even know because sin has infected our lives. I love you and I want to get to know you. I've gotten to know a lot of you better in Omega, through the Omega Trail experience and the fellowship that we've had. And I love you, and I would love to know you better, and you would love to know me better. But sin, pride, those kind of things keep us from knowing each other. But when that is done away with, listen, we will know each other in perfect harmony. There won't be sin in, li in our lives anymore. Sin won't separate us at all. As a matter of fact, here's what Dan Schaefer says, and I love this. Heaven will be a city of new people, regenerated, renewed, and perfect. Imagine upon arriving in heaven that you discover to your delight that the first person you, love, you met you loved, you loved so dearly and deeply that it took your breath away, and that this expression of love was neither embarrassed nor made you feel strange. You were able to receive this person's love as easily as he or she was able to give it. Then imagine the next person that you meet Loved you with an, equi equi unequ uh, with an equi equivalent but unique, perfect love as well. On earth, all of our love is sin-infected and sin-affected. The best of our loves have struggled with resentment, envy, jealousy, pride, anger, 
and other sinful ingredients. In heaven, each person will be your new best friend. Is that not cool? Heaven can't be boring because we will be enriched by other people that we're going to know. No, we're going to meet. The Bible says in that verse of Scripture in Revelation 7, 9, And behold, I saw a multitude that you can't even count. There are so many people there that you can't even count. When my kids were younger, you ever heard this? Uh, parents, I know you've never heard this. Daddy, I'm bored. You ever heard that? Daddy, I'm bored. I told Hayden one time, I don't even know if he remembers this, he come in, Daddy, I'm bored. So I took him outside, big old ant bed right there in the front of the yard. And I stomped on it. And I said, here, count them. And I walked off. And he stood there a minute, and one, two, three. Daddy, that's impossible. I said, Dad, well, count them. You ever, you ever just stirred up an ant bed and just seen them all going around? That's, I mean, there's going to be so many people in heaven that you and I can't even count. When you, you think about the people that we're going to meet. Think about the people that we're going to see. Now, let me give you a third one. All right, so heaven can't be boring because we're going to be exploring we're going to also be enriched by meeting new people. But third, heaven can't be boring because we will be engulfed in a symphony of praise. Now, where does that come from? Look at Revelation chapter 5 and verse 6. Go to Revelation chapter 5. Just turn over a little bit just to the left. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, and which are the seven... Uh, spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Now, look at verse 11. Skip down to verse 11. And I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was myriads upon a myriads and thousands upon thousands. Now look at verse 12. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Now, here's what I don't want you to get bogged down with. People will look at that and they'll say, Well, with these four living creatures with all of these things, what does that mean? Look, I'm not here to explain the book of Revelation to you. But here's what I am going to say. Look at what he says in verse number, verse number 11. That he looked and he saw thousands upon thousands upon thousands. And what were they doing? They were praising God. They were praising God. Heaven can't be boring because we will be praising God. We will be praising Him. This is a specific event that has taken place in heaven. And this is where the Lamb of God, who, by the way, is Jesus Christ, comes forward and he opens up the scrolls. And to announce the final chapter is going to take place, all right? And so these people just absolutely fall down into praise. Now, let me ask you a question. You ready? Be careful how you answer this question, all right? Have you ever been to a boring worship service? Be careful how you answer, all right? Be careful how you answer. Have you ever been to a boring worship service? The answer is no. You may have been to a boring church service, but you have never been to a boring worship service. If you've been to a boring worship service, number one, you're probably worshiping the wrong thing. Okay? Because I can promise you, in worship, I've never been to a boring worship service. Now, some people say, well, wait a minute, Brother Jason. You mean to tell me all we're going to be doing is having church all day, all day, all day? You know, he, here's the funny thing. I, I love Sundays. I mean, I had been preaching for over 10 years, okay? Delivering, teaching God's Word. And I, I, don't, I don't know of a time when I woke up on Sunday morning and go, oh, man, it's Sunday. I wake up in the morning on Sunday morning with a nervousness. There's an anticipation because I have an opportunity to share the Word of God. I love Sundays, okay? I love Sundays. I love to be here. I love to preach. Somebody told me the other day, said, man, I love, to, I love. they told me this. You know, you hear people say, I love to hear you preach. This person told me, I love to see you preach. I said, what? I never heard that. He said, yeah, yeah. You're not only preach, and I like to hear you preach, but I like to watch you too. Because you like, you, you actually, you actually like you having a good time. You know what? I am. I am. Because I love to preach the Word of God. I love church. But most people 
Can't take too much church. You know, it's funny. The most enjoyable thing a lot of people do at church is to leave. They do. Yeah, they come in, the worship is over, and they storm out into the parking lot, and they have positioned their cars for a quick getaway. That's exactly what they do. Come in. Can't wait until, I mean, yeah, man, oh man, golly. You know, when is this going to be over? The best thing about church to some folks is leaving. They can't wait to get out fast enough. I'll be sitting at the back door. Now, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, some of y'all, I'm going to hurt y'all right here because it's going to hurt. I'm sitting at the back door, sitting out there, and I'm shaking hands. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, I love you. Okay, I love you. So I'm shaking hands, you know. Good to see you. Man, it's good to see you. Well, somebody come up to me one day. I said, hey, you okay? Said, yeah, I'm fine. I said, I didn't see you Sunday. Well, I was here. I said, I didn't see you. I didn't get a chance to see you. Well, I was here. Boy, all upset because I didn't get a chance. I, didn't, I thought they weren't here. I said, well, when, you, when I was shaking hands, I said, well, I ducked out the back door. And then here's what I asked. Well, why did you do that? I didn't want basically you wanted to get you wanted to get to the restaurant before them Methodists got there. You wanted to get out. There's too many people in here. You know, we come to church and we spend about three hours on Sunday morning in church. And and, and we come out of church service. We can't wait to get home. And then we get home and we go, you know what? Whew, man, I checked that off my list. I went and gave God three hours this week. That's that's enough, right? So you know what, a, a, a worship service that lasts forever and ever and ever don't appeal to a lot of people. I had a lady one time come up to my music, music, our music minister. He was old band director. <laughs> Didn't have a lot of tact. <laughs> and <laughs> this lady come up and she said, I didn't like that song. And I didn't like this song. And that was too loud. And every Sunday morning... She just came and just chewed Randy out. And I mean, it got to the point that even me and the preacher were just kind of waiting to watch her come chew him out. And so we'd stand around there, and here she comes. I'll tell you, I didn't like that. I didn't like this. I didn't like that. Finally, Randy, about after a month of this, of her constantly having a complaint about something, he finally looked at her, and he said, Ma'am, he said, I want to invite you to come and be a part and go to heaven. She, he said, never mind. You won't like it. And she said, what do you mean? He said, because we're going to be singing these same kind of songs for eternity. You may not like it. Folks, listen. There's a lot of people that think, that, well, we're going to be in a worship service all day long. Man, that just doesn't sound too much fun to me. I'm going to tell you, John Eldridge writes this. He says, we have settled on an image of the never-ending sing-along in the sky, one great hymn after another, forever and ever, amen. And our heart sinks forever and ever. That's good news. And then we sigh and feel guilty that we are not more spiritual. We lose heart and we turn once more to the present things of this world. Here is what I'm going to tell you is not what's going to be heaven. We are not going to sing 20,001 verses of amazing grace over and over again. Or just as I am, over and over again. And now you can say amen to this. It's not going to be one continuous long sermon for eternity. Amen. I knew that was coming. Here is what it, I love to listen to music. I love to listen to music as I study. I study God's Word, and I listen to music. My son calls it elevator music. I like to listen to that kind of music sometimes. I like to listen to a lot of music. It's on in the background. How many of you have ever been riding down the road, and a song come on, and all of a sudden you start singing along? Raise your hand if you do that. Raise your hand. Good, good. All right, just singing along. You see, to me, what heaven is going to be like is going to be like a movie soundtrack. The music's going to be playing and you're going to know and you're going to be aware of it playing in the background, but the music's not going to be the main thing. You see what I'm saying? It's going to be there, and it's going to be playing in the background, and it's going to be going, and it's going to be a tune that you'll remember. 
I remember sitting, Dave, Brother David, I remember sitting by a, a man at, at, at our former church. And every time we would sing, he would sing. And I am telling you, this man was awful. Awful. He, he could carry a tune. He just didn't know how to let it go. I mean, he was bad. And we would stand up and sing because everybody had their same spot, just like y'all do. Every Sunday morning, y'all sit in the same spot. Somebody sits in your spot, and you go, they in my spot. You know, you know where people are sitting. And, and here, anyway, we sat by him, and it was like every Sunday morning he would sit. And then I joined the choir, all right? I joined the choir because I thought, you know what? That would be the best place to get away from it. Two weeks later, he joins the choir. All right. I loved my ministry of music, but evidently he didn't like me much. Because he sits me right there beside that joker. And I'm in the choir, and we'd sing special music, and there he is. I always said he was a prisoner singer. He was always behind a few bars and never could find the right key. He was awful, awful. I'm talking about terrible. But he died. And when he died, I went to the, when we went to his funeral, and I still walked by that casket, and I just gave him a wink. And now I went, hot dog, he can sing on key now. <laughs> he knows the tune, and he's singing. Y'all ever heard somebody, you know, people used to say well, all the time, well, you know what, they didn't say I have to sing good. The Bible said just make a joyful noise. Folks, look, when the emphasis is on noise, there's a problem there, okay? Some of us may not be able to carry that tune. Some of us may be a little off-key. But when we get to heaven, it won't matter at all. We'll be perfect. We'll be able to sing it. We'll be able to hear it. We'll be able to know it. And you might, well, what if I don't know that song? You'll know it. You'll know it. You'll know it. You'll know it. So go ahead and make that joyful noise while we're here, all right? Go ahead and make it because one day we're going to be all in perfect pitch and in perfect harmony. Let me give you the fourth one. Let me give you the fourth one. Heaven can't be boring because we'll be energized by serving the Lord. Some people say, well, what do you mean? What are we going to be doing all day, Jason? We're going to be just, do you know that you're going to work in heaven? Some of you are already going, you know what? No, I ain't going. It's not going to be that kind of work, folks. All right? But we are going to be working in heaven. Now, I want to show you where that is found. Look at uh, Revelation chapter 22 and verse number 3. And there shall be no longer any curse. What was the first curse? We had to work. Adam and Eve, the moment they ate of the fruit and disobeyed God, that was when they began to have to work. That was when nature started working against Adam and Eve. And then they had to work. Now look at this. And the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his bondservants shall, and don't miss this, serve him. We will be serving him the Lord we are going to work in heaven and guess what our work is going to involve serving God serving the Lord we are going to be serving him we will be ruling we will be reigning with Christ how about this remember when Jesus told the parable of the faithful servant and Jesus said you have been faithful here now I'm going to make you ruler of more I'm going to tell you, I think that is exactly what's going to happen in heaven. Folks, we are going to work, but our bodies won't wear out. We are going to work, and it's not going to be work like we've ever seen it before. Many of When I said work, many of you automatically thought about maybe going out in the fields and working, going to your job and working. No, it's not going to be a toiling work like that. It's going to be a total different work. Dan Schaefer writes this, God did not create me for a short 70 to 80 year lifespan i was created for eternity the gifts the passions and ability that god has given and revealed to you are and will remain for your entire earthly existence only in the embryo stage and those gifts will be yours forever a part of you that god always had in mind to bloom in you forever none of us even the most accomplished among us has ever experienced anything but the bare bidding of our God given talents and gifts. What am I saying? Have you ever accomplished something in your life? You ever accomplished that job? Whatever it may be, it may have been graduating college. It may have been graduating high school. Some of you graduating kindergarten. 
Just kidding. It could have been anything. You remember when you made that goal? You remember when you accomplished that goal, the pride that you felt in doing that? Now, multiply that. That's what it's going to be like in heaven. We are going to have an opportunity to work in heaven, and it's going to be absolute perfection. Now, let me give you the fifth one. Heaven can't be boring because we will be enjoying the presence of Jesus. We will be enjoying the presence of Jesus. Turn to Revelation chapter 22 and verse 4. Just go down the, little, the next verse of Scripture. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. Now, what does that word mean, on the foreheads? We're going to stamp Jesus right there on the forehead. Is that we're going to all walk around and it's going to be Jesus right there on the forehead? No, that's not what that means. Remember I told you that Revelation is deeply symbolic. Well, here's what I believe that means right there. You ever heard, now put this in, make, let this be on the forefront of your mind. You ever heard that? That's where a statement comes from right there. Because Jesus will be on the forefront of our minds. That's all, he'll be, that's all we'll be thinking about. That's it. Because you know what? We will be with him. He will be with us. The, think about this. In, in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse number 12, just write it in the margin of your notes, and I want to refer to it real quick. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. So here's what Paul is saying. What we're seeing now is a blurred image of Jesus Christ. But one day, listen to this, one day our faith will end in sight. And we will be able to see without blurred vision. It's like a picture. Have you ever seen a picture that's kind of out of focus? A camera that's out of focus? We will be able to see clearly. And once we see clearly, it will be beautiful. Somebody asked me, and in some of your questions, somebody asked me this week, Brother Jason, you think we'll be married in heaven? I do. I do. I think we'll be married in heaven. We'll be married to Jesus. Because you know what? We are the bride of Christ. And he has come and gotten us. And we are going to have a marriage feast. Folks, we're going to eat in heaven. Yes, we are. We ain't going to worry about cholesterol. Eat all the ice cream we want. Don't have no doctor saying, you need to lose weight. That's going to be heaven right there. You know why it's going to be heaven? Because we ain't going to need no doctors anymore. I'm sorry, those of you that are doctors. Hey, don't worry, I'm out of a job too. <laughs> when we get to heaven, there ain't going to be no need for me. I used to tell the guy that ran the funeral home, he is, a, he is an undertaker. I used to tell him all the time, I'd say, you know what? We better enjoy it down here because we're going to be out of job when we get to heaven. <laughs> there won't be no need to preach it anymore. You know why? Because he's going to be standing right there. Ain't going to be no undertakers needed anymore. Ain't going to be no cemeteries in heaven. Isn't that going to be great? There ain't going to be no separation. We are not going to be separated. We're going to be married to Jesus. Isn't that cool? The Bible says that he's going to come back. In the, well, I just read, remember I told you? He's going to come back like a groom ready to get his bride. We are the bride of Christ. And folks, we are going to be married to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, my question is this. Are you going to be there? A teacher was trying to explain to her kindergarten class about heaven. And so she closed the class by saying, all right, boys and girls, what have we got to do to get to heaven? The little boy raised his hand and said, die. <laughs> the Bible says it is appointed that a man wants to die and in the judgment. Can I tell you this? You're going to die. I know, oh, I know. You came here today, doom and gloom, day outside, and you came here today to have the preacher make you feel better. And lo and behold, I made you feel worse by telling you you're going to die. You're going to die. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready to meet him? That's a question that I can't answer for you. You can't answer for me. Parents, let me just tell you this. You love to answer for your children. We're in a society today where, parents, we, we, we have got to start letting our kids take responsibility. Because we're having, we've got too many jails that are full of kids that ain't learning to take responsibility. 
And folks, we have got to start letting our kids make mistakes on their own and stop bailing them out. Now, I said that because I wanted to say this. You can't answer for your children in heaven. God is, I am not going to, as much as I love Hayden and as much as I love Mallory, I am going to stand in front of God and God is going to look at me and say, you know what, how did you raise him? I'm going to be accountable for that, but I am not going to be accountable for what he does. That's him. That's on him. Parents, you better start teaching your kids how to answer because one day they will. You can't answer for your children. Your mom and daddy can't answer to you. I had a, a, a good preacher friend of mine, an old black preacher, and here's what he told me one day. He said, God ain't got no grandchildren. He said, all he got is children. And I'm going to tell you what, God has no grandchildren. Folks, you are the only one that can answer this question right here. Are you ready to meet Jesus? Are you ready to meet Jesus? In the twinkling of an eye. You want me to tell you how quick that is? Right there. That quick right there. You could breathe your last breath and you could open your eyes into eternity. And let me tell you, if you are waiting to see Jesus before you make a decision, you're waiting, it's going to be too late. Too late. Years ago, years ago, in 1923, a lady by the name of Nettie Dudley Washington wrote a song that was totally ignored until 1993, and a man by the name of Bill Gaither got a hold of it. Y'all know Bill Gaither? He was one of the 12 disciples. <laughs> At least that's what a lot of Southern Baptists believe. Bill Gaither grabbed a hold of this song, and let me share it with you. As I entered the gates of that city, my loved ones all knew me well. They took me down the streets of heaven. Such scenes were too many to tell. I saw Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob talk with Mark and Timothy. But I said, I want to see Jesus because he's the one who died for me. I bowed on my knees and cried holy, holy, holy. Let me ask you a question. When you see Jesus face to face, will you be ready? I've talked about the activities in heaven and what we're going to do there, and there is absolutely no way that we're going to be bored. We're going to have too much to do to be bored. My question is this. Have you made your reservation? I want you to bow your head with me. Somebody asked me one time and said, Thank you for joining us today. We want you to know that you are always welcome at the summit. We are located on Highway 81 south of Loganville. Sunday school is at 9 a.m. and worship is at 10.30 a.m. For more information, you can visit our website at thesummitchurch.com.